And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of D20Go, the, li the lightest polyhedral you will find. The one and only Kevin Parsons. How are you doing tonight, man? I'm great, Mildred. How are you? I am doing good. I am doing good. It is still a little too warm for my taste. <laughs> right. And again, this is why some people keep calling me the Ice Dragon. Yeah, man. I'm I'm ready for spring already. Let's get this winter over with. You realize now that you said that the groundhog is is gonna end up seeing the shadow just to spite you. Yeah. That, that bastard's never on my side anyway, so he can, he can do it. He's never on my side. He's never on my side anyways. I, th I, I, think, I, need to, um, I think I need to pay his handlers more money. <laughs> I don't know. The Keep trying to get my daughter to watch Groundhog Day. I think she's, I think four years old is ready. That's ready for Groundhog Day, right? Maybe not. On one, on one hand, I don't, I don't know the, um, the whole, the whole, the whole thing with the toaster might give some people ideas. True. Yeah. True. Then, then again, um, I was eleven years old when I saw the thing. Oh. <laughs> Which uh, was not was not the right time to be watching a film like that, and I... the and the the whole thing with the the defibrillator scarred me for years. <laughs> um. And I, and and apparently my apparently my mentor had seen had saw had seen Alien when he was too young to see it. So I don't know. I guess uh, I guess it. I guess I was just the latest example of that kind of thing. Everybody gets scarred by something in their childhood, right? Yeah. When I was growing up, everybody was scarred by it, and then when I finally saw it, I was like, seriously, that's it. I think mine was uh, Mrs. Risby and the Rats of Nim. I was like five or something when that came out, and it was just just a little bit too dark for a little kid. Yeah, um, yeah. There were there were a few of those that ended up get because of the fact that there's the stereotype of animation being for kids. Uh, there were a few that got put into the shuffle that um, probably shouldn't have. Yeah, I remember working in a um at at a um at a well at the time they were known as Tidal Wave, um. Then later Hollywood, vi then later Hollywood video, but occasionally, some occasionally somebody would bring up Nim or Return to Oz or um, Watership Down, and oh and, yeah, and, and say is and say is this appropriate from is this appropriate for my kids? Yeah, Watership and, Down is shit about bunnies, right? That's not scary. <laughs> and you know the you know the shoulder angel who's supposed to remind you of your morals and your du mm -hmm. and your duty to be a good person. I didn't hear a peep out of that guy. <laughs> I just heard my shoulder devil say, "Say nothing." <laughs> yeah. And then, then they'd then they'd rent it anyways, and then come back a day later, getting pissed off, and I was nowhere to be found because nobody was gonna snitch on me. <laughs> a bad employee, right there. Um, or rather, rather a good, rather a good. Imp I don't know. Is it the case of the best of the worst, or the worst of the best? Yeah, but that being said, I often like to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. So, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Oh, uh, all right. First, the first role playing game we ever tried uh, was me and my little crew of high school friends. Um, I guess it was about 96 and we had the uh, the advanced dungeons and dragons starter kit and I, I cannot for the life of me remember if it was the one with or without the audio cd um i would love to get a hold of that audio cd um i made a uh, a wizard named percival and at some point i don't remember the adventure at all i don't know why i remember my character and i remember that at some point i got my hand on the uh, the deck of many things oh, and the card i drew uh advanced me to level five. So very early on in the game, I'm like slinging fireballs. And, uh, you know, those wizards, they started off so slow 
and then you, you were just if you were ahead of the party you were just so so overpowered yeah and, uh, we all got hooked we got hooked um tv tropes refers to it as linear warriors quadratic wizards oh yeah yep yep that felt right so which uh, which is one of those things you can bring you can bring up to impress your math teacher i know because I did. <laughs> yeah um but when it comes but and and admittedly that admittedly that's that whole that whole wizard non wizard um gap is one of those relics from the chainmail days in my opinion. It is yeah. funny to see some people try and defend it when the the big problem is when you give um one when you give one sort of archetype more so much more to do. There's going to be less room in the book for others unless you expand the page size, which that's not going to come cheap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. It is it is interesting that you started out with A D and D because a lot of the people that I've had who started out around that time they started with the red box. And I'm yeah. I'm guessing I'm guessing you started with A D and D first edition, not second. It was it was second. Oh, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure the one that came out in '96 was second edition. Yeah, that yeah, yeah that was second. Ninety six. That would be that would be second edition. The bl during the black during the uh, black book era. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, I remember the uh, as soon as we got into it, we started buying up all the books and everything. And then there was the uh, second edition had the players option stuff. And so yeah, we, that, uh, that's we, the black book edition. I've got I've got plenty of those. And we went options. head first into that, you know. So it was, you know, all the. What was it? A non-player options, or or the weird acronym for it? Uh, and we threw all those in there, you know, trying to develop our game as much as we could, just to see all the all the things you could do with it. You know, I think that's what it was about: was exploring all the options out there. Oh yeah. And now, when it comes to the concept of D of D twenty go, um, one of the things that I know that I immediately noticed is. Is making some nods to pl to play by post or play by email, which is of course a long stand long standing time honored tradition, but it's one that I don't see addressed in in actual game books all that often. Mm, it really isn't. And, uh, that's what that's what led me down this road. Really, um, I uh, I don't have time for you know I'm a, I'm a dad and I'm a teacher and I just I don't have time for like dedicated gaming sessions. I used to have a group that met every Sunday. It was like a, a six hour thing. We'd get together Sunday, a little afternoon and we'd be playing the entire day. And I just don't have six hours or even three hours to, to, to do every other week or whatever you're, you know, we're scheduling. And I wanted something you could do just here and there. And uh, play by post is hard with most ro tabletop role playing games. Cause once you did into combat, uh, it's just, you know, uh, well, all right. So, the GM describes a, uh, a combat scenario, and he's like, all right, roll for initiative. And that's the GM's post that day. The other players throughout the day, you know, whenever they get a chance to check in, will roll their initiative. And that's all you get done that day is initiative. And then the day two, you're rolling the first round of combat. And depending on people's work schedules, you may not get to resolve that first round of combat until day three. And everybody I've talked to said that most, unless you, you've got people that are really online a lot um combat it usually takes about a week or two mm -hmm. and even and i'd i'd imagine it's even doubly so if you're do if you're doing play by email oh yeah i can't i, I can't even imagine that i think most of those people sort of uh ignore the com combat or do narrative uh, games and there are na good really good narrative game systems you have the freedom to just describe the scene on your own. Each each player has that kind of agency, and that's cool and all. And I'm I'm totally down with the narrative stuff, but uh, I just like rolling dice, you know. And to take the dice out of it to me is taking the the game part out of it. Yeah, and when it comes, I think that I think that's also the reason why a lot of play by e a lot of play by post or play by email ones. They tend to really de-emphasize co combat because, well, it's kind, it's kind of hard to do it. Or they ridiculously simplify it to the point that it becomes a glorified coin toss. Or like the kind of random generation you would see in an old game book. Like, say, Fighting Fantasy. Yeah. 
and not that there's anything wrong with that and I and I like um I like fighting fantasy and I like advanced fighting fantasy but there's no reason that that's the approach that you should do. Yeah, yeah I agree. Now with but with that kind, with that kind of thing in mind would you would you say that the approach that you took with D20 Go was more reminiscent of um, some of some of the sandbox in fifth edition. Not with the not with the combat. Um, well, the, really, the goal not with, obviously not with the combat, but but within the character design. Or would you say that it has more in common with um with AD and D? Uh, actually, I started conceptually. I started with three point five. Three point five was the version I, I know the best. Um, so that's where I started with the concept. I even had in the original version one of D20 Go, we had uh, six stats, um, you know, kind of like Dungeons and Dragons has its seven stats and everything. So I had the stats and everything in, in the original system. Um, I just ended up paring away that stuff. You know, as we as we play tested over and over, I, I realized that, you know, you want to trim anything that's not absolutely necessary to the game. So I wanted to get rid of, you know, especially if you're playing on your phone, you know, check it in while you're on, on the subway or, you know, you're on a short, you know, 15 minute break at, at work. Um, you don't want to have to go through all of your stats and try to remember that. You shouldn't have to reference a lot of stuff. So I, I trimmed anything that I didn't feel was necessary. But the, the core of the game, the, con con the concept of the game really started with third or third 3.5. Mm -hmm. And given that now, given that. You mentioned that you went for, that you went from the the six stats that um, that three point five has. How did you end up paring that down to the heroics trinity that you have? The the six stats ended up turning into the traits system that the uh, the D twenty ah. Go uses, which is a uh, very very similar to uh, John Harper's uh, Lady Blackbird. Mm -hmm. um, just the idea of giving your character a couple descriptors. You know, this is. You know, Rogan the the strong. There we go. My character is strong. There's his main identifying trait. So uh, if I'm rolling any kind of strength check, I'm going to get a bonus to that. Uh, just to simplify all of those those core stats down into just descriptors. You know, my character is weak, but he's also very intelligent. And and there, I don't have to worry about stats or numbers for those things. Um, the heroic system came out of a. And it would, originally, I was like, okay, if you all the all the the encounters that I'm trying to boil down, I was like, how many different kinds of encounters there are, uh, uh, or are there? And I, I had, I think, six heroics. We had six stats, six heroics, and six schools at first. Six schools of magic, mm -hmm. and had like this uh, sort of a, I don't know, this, just sort of this parallelism going through the thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the heroics were wilderness, um, dungeoneering. Um, I think Slaughter was one of the original ones. And we had like six six basic kinds of encounters, and uh, I realized that was even that was too much to keep up with. It was just unnecessary. Uh, and some of the more basic ones, the Wilderness and Dungeoneering, didn't get rolled as much as the other ones. So I, I pared it down to just just about combat mm -hmm. and looking at combat from different approaches. And I was thinking about it. Each of the heroics represents a, an approach to combat. So if you are rolling slaughter, it means that you are recklessly charging. It's pure offense. All I care about is doing damage. I don't care if I get hit on the, on the way. I'm just going to do damage. And then skirmish is like the rogue or the archer or the wizard that's standing way at the back. That's like, I'm going to sling some spells or I'm going to shoot some arrows, but I better not get touched. You know, there better be a, a meat shield blocking me. Uh, and then the melee is the the in-between, the, the paladin that's trying to protect the other party members or the person that's... You know, if you're a strategist and you're trying to control the battlefield, um, you're rolling melee. Um, so you're you're thinking about offense and you're out there, you know, throwing yourself, you know, to the wolves, so to speak. But you're also thinking about defense at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, after playtesting, we got it onto those three, and those three seem to cover everything that was involved in combat. Uh, now, while I have done a sci-fi hack of D20 Go, it's called Star 20 Go, and it's on Drive Through RPG also. Yeah. And then sci-fi, I was thinking, well, you've got blaster battles and everything. Um, combat. So the heroics in in the sci-fi version are brawl and cover. You know, as if you're taking cover fire and strafe. You know, the guy that's strafing across the battlefield, not ducked down behind something. Mm -hmm. So the heroics should 
represent thematically represent the kind of game that you're playing, but still just three numbers to keep up with. Yeah. And now, when it come when it came to when it came to the when it came to the classes that you that you ended up go ended up going with, obviously with a, with a lot of them, I can see some. Um, I can see some. I can see some of them having having analogs to D and D classes proper. But were there a few of them oh, yeah. that didn't have an analog that you felt you wanted to put that archetype in sim- simply because it, it it wasn't one that you felt could blend all that all that well with um with an estab- with an established class? Like in, in one of these cases that immediately comes to mind for me is the swashbuckler. Uh, I think one thing that always drove me crazy about D and D is that, and this is three point five. I don't think it's still like, quite like this with the uh, fifth edition. But the, if you want to build a, a heavy tank in D and D, you play a fighter. If you want to build an archer that is, you know, a total Legolas character, you play a fighter. <laughs> to me, that's like absurd. You know, like, like honestly, those characters. That's are still, cool. Honestly, that's still a problem. Really, really. So this, it's that's it, they seem like total opposites to me. They should have a a distinct play style from each other. Um, and so what I, I I did totally um, use D and D. I mean, you have to use D and D. It's I mean, it, it's the king of, of role playing games. And I don't even know. I wouldn't say that it's the best role playing game out there right now, but it is still the king of role playing games. You know. And so it, it's definitely a lot of a lot of inspiration came from the D and D characters. Um, but having the three the three different fighting characters gave me an opportunity to have them excel in different ways. You know, the the vanguard. Is the the big tank, you know, um, the guy that's up front in armor, uh, and he's going to be in mastering sl- slaughter and melee. Mm-hmm. The, um, the squash buckler masters slaughter and skirmish. He's not likely to have the melee, the defensive capability of the vanguard, and then the martial artist picks up the skirmish and the melee. So mm-hmm. each one has a different focus. Um, the idea of differentiating that that vanguard character really came from Monty Cook's Arcana Evolved. Oh um, yeah, which was. A, a variant of 3.5 and it was, it was mm-hmm. just so beautifully done that and his iron hero is the low fantasy one because in arcana evolved there was the champion no no it was the it was the war main the war main was the guy just in a crap ton of armor whereas there was a i don't remember what it was called now but there was a, a like a light light attacker the duelist character um and so i wanted to i wanted to differentiate the different types of fighters rather than just bump them all together now, when it comes to when it comes to the whole leg when it comes to the whole Legolas thing, that pe- whenever that gets brought up, some um, I've seen some people say, "Well, you should you should be playing a ranger with that." But the prob the problem is the problem with that is the fact that when we have historical examples of 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 fighters in armor while you while using but while using bows, and there's whole ar- there's whole armies who had that approach. Mm-hmm, um, yep. It ma- it it makes a little less sense to to have it relegated to the ranger who is supposed to be more of the terrain guy. But I'd say it's I'd, for me personally, I'd say it's a consequence of having the fighters claim to fame being the guy who's good with weapons. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the ranger always seemed like a weird class to me. Like a class should be about its its mechanical. A place in the game, not its story. You know, if a ranger is the terrain guy, it's all about you know he loves the wilderness. Well, hell, anybody can love the wilderness, you know. And it's weird for it to be a seven, its own separate class. And to call Legolas is a ra- a ranger is kind of a, a slap in Aragorn's face, isn't it? It's one. It's one of those things that's <laughs> that's technically true, but kind of but kind of misleading. Yeah. Um. Now, yeah, now, yes, the ra- the ranger cla- the ranger class was obviously influenced by the rangers in to- in Tolkien's work. Mm-hmm. No, mm-hmm. no one's going to deny that. But at the same at the same time, you've probably you've probably seen this. There's there's a bit of a disconnect with what the description of a class says it is and what it actually is. Um, yeah. Like one of the, one of the ways I easily see that with what you've got is the fact that your XP of the monk is the martial artist because let's face it, no mm-hmm. nobody's picking monk to do the whole you're you're a priest and and they from a far off cloister or something like that. No, you're picking it because yeah. you want to do kung fu. Yeah, that's and that's why I changed the name of it. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that was clear. Um, 
I remember that Fantasy Craft um, did something sim- did something similar to that, where the the faith based aspects they made of the monk they made into an advanced class, and the ter- and the monk as as it's commonly understood was rebranded as the martial artist. <clears throat> um, and again, they also then again, Fantasy Craft also did something similar when it came to splitting off the fighter by splitting that off into soldier, lancer, and um, scout. Oh yeah, I had that. I, I totally had the kung fu idea in mind when I when I created that class. And then the very first playtest we ran, uh, this guy plays this. He plays a martial artist named. Um, uh, he called himself the Nightmare. Um, something Rhodes. Dust, it wasn't Dusty Rhodes, but it was obviously a reference to Dusty Rhodes, and the character was a luchador. So he used the martial artist class to make a luchador. And then I had a, a few games later, a guy used the martial artist, artist class to do that, that British gentleman's martial art. Uh, Batiste, oh, I can't remember the name bare, of it. You know what I'm knuckle, talking about? Bare knuckle boxing? No, 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 not the bare knuckle. Not the, the, it's like it's fighting with a cane or an umbrella in a suit. And like it's it's the most absurd thing. Um, so he's like this British gentleman martial artist, and it was it was awesome. He was it was a very cool character. Um, Bartitsu. Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. Yep. Which um, I have to wonder if he was watch- I have to wonder if he was watching either the Avengers or Kingsman. No, not the Marvel yeah, yeah. Avengers, <laughs> the original Avengers. <laughs> it totally came off came across as a Kingsman character. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna pass a ju- I'm not gonna pass a judgment on that. Although <laughs> it, although one, although um, I could easily see some. I could easily someone see someone argue um, how where the where the line is between what would count, what would count as a swashbuckler and what would count as a martial artist in that regard. Um, oh yeah, that's true. The the approach that I'd probably take if somebody asked me that at my table is that a martial artist is some is somebody who takes their studies very seriously. A swashbuckler is the kind of person who would prefer to kick your ass and look good doing it. Yeah, I would I would absolutely agree with that. But the uh, the idea with D twenty go and all those classes is that you can do whatever you want with them. I didn't want to build a, a too much theme in any of the classes or too much flavor in any of the classes because I wanted people to be able to customize mm-hmm. and tool them in the way that you know to play play whatever character you want you know people talk about oh we need a we need a cleric in our game we really need a pl- paladin and if, to hell with all that you know play play what you want to play man have fun with the game yeah um you pro you probably had to suffer through the whole okay who's going to be the healer que- question at tables at, at least once oh yeah who hasn't and, and you don't you don't there that question doesn't exist in d20 go people ask me and i'm like dude just like just play whatever you want we don't have a healer. We'll figure it out. Yeah. No, oh, I, I, I was one of the people who outright defended the whole healing surges thing that caused so much controversy when Fourth Edition came around. Because but, I, because I looked at that and I, and I said, okay, okay, we have a, we have a means to make to take the pressure off of the cleric as being the heal bot, so that the cleric can do other things. Because if, because, mm-hmm. well, pon- ponder this. If if I'm a, if I'm a cleric of let's go with Tweird, you know the the one handed Norse war god. Uh huh. Yeah. Why the hell am I healing people? Right. Exactly. Shouldn't you be out there sacrificing yourself? Isn't that what Tyr did? Yeah. Well, yeah. the the point The point is 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 if if I'm doing a um. If if my if I'm playing a cleric and my god isn't a god who has healing as its domain, why am I expected to heal? Yeah. Oh. It's that's one of those that's one of those things that it's a case of D and D's tradition problem. I guess I guess is one way to put it. Um, yeah. And speak speaking of that, I want I wanted to talk a bit about how you've approached um, magic. Now. Obviously, obviously, you're wor- you're working with a degree of a spell list, but if I'm not mistaken, you wanted to explicitly avoid dealing with the Vancian model. Yeah, the idea of spell slots. I mean, I, I, we never dealt with it, even playing around tabletop with my friends. It was just it was an unnecessary headache. Uh, you know, you shouldn't. 
a, pen, a character shouldn't be penalized to that extent. You know, if you've got a spell, then cast a spell. Um, I just, I, I think that it, it ruins a lot of the fun and flavor of, of a spellcaster. Mm-hmm. And I get that that's a big part of the balance of D and D. So I wanted to try to figure out a different way to balance things. You know, yeah. Um, but we, I was just always tinkering with those spells. You know, there was the, the idea of um, spells taking away some of your your health or con- or constitution, kind of like Raceland and the Dragonlance stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know we told with that for a while. There was um, just like a mana point system, alternative rule set for D and D that we tried for a while. Um, it was just all it was just all more headache than I think it should have been. I I personally ended up using the the uh, sy- the system that was put forth in Slayers D twenty. What was the, that one? Um, the idea the idea was that you was that casting spells. Um, it doesn't take MP or something like that, but it tires you out. Um, yeah. You basically mm-hmm. t- you take non lethal damage, but if you're but if you're good at your spell casting role, you can mitigate that damage. I, uh, with D twenty go because we do, aren't doing turn based combat, uh, I found that it was it was actually pretty easy to balance the spell system. Um, you know, it, if you're whether you're casting spells or fighting with a sword, you have a certain um, certain uh, total combat power, really, and that's what the heroics represent. So a wizard might have a 10 in slaughter the same as a fighter might have a 10 in slaughter. Uh, the fighter's 10 in slaughter represents his ability to swing that broadsword and bash faces in, whereas the wizard's 10 in slaughter is his ability to, to get those spells off quickly, you know, to start slinging magic missiles or whatever he needs. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't have to worry about balancing the spells within combat. It was just about balance outside of combat. You know, how do the wizards have too much power to be able to cast anything in their spell book. Uh, and all I, all I did was make it where spells resolve last. So if you, if you start casting in a bar, a bar fight's about to break out and you start casting, everybody around you sees that you're casting a spell. And second edition D and D did this, you know, you don't automatically get to resolve the spell. You don't say, Oh, I cast magic missile. And you go ahead and roll your attack um, or roll your damage. You had, you say, you declare your casting and then everybody else gets to respond to that. And if a guy sitting beside you decides to punch you in the face while you're casting, then sorry, dude, your spell's gone, you know? And uh, to me, that took care of the balance issue, and, and we didn't have to worry about spell slots or anything. Hey, as, as the saying goes, geek the mage first. Yeah, exactly, for real. Um, and per- personally, when it came to, when it came to um, spells available, the only spells that I'd really... Um, I'd really ban were ones where I felt it was dipping into other characters' turf. Like, oh yeah, um, like knock or it, or mm. in some case, in a case like that, in a case in a case like knock, I had had it that it's that it on, it only applies to magic locks. Oh yeah, because um, the because the mindset I'm having it is. Imagine, imagine being a thief and ha- and having to having to roll these per- these perilous checks to try to try and open up the lock and not raise an alarm, and then the wizard can come in and just cast nu- just cast um one spell and do and do the job that you were gonna roll for. Yeah. Um. And I assume you you relax that restriction a little bit if there's no rogue in the group. If there's if there's no if there's no rogue in the group, then I'm probably not going to be using all that many tra- all that many um, traps, anyways. Oh man, I would, but I, I, maybe I'm a mean GM. Well, unless I'm feeling spiteful, of, co- of course. <laughs> but yeah. I'm not going. I'm not going to. It's usually going. It's usually going to be traps that there that were going to be unavoidable. In that mm-hmm. case, like this, like. A situation where there's not a rogue, that's where I'm going to put the giant boulder like it's Indiana Jones or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, oh. And, of course, the other um, the other type of spell that I, de- that I definitely put a, lo- put a lot of restriction on were spells that, spells that afforded players a bit too much narrative control. Mm-hmm. Um, stuff like Scry, Teleport, Wish... Those kind, those kind of things, where, where uh, they, where I think, where they, I felt like they were taking narrative control away from the DM. A teleport is a, it's a very hard spell to to work with and to balance. 
I'm not. Sh I'm not sure what your approach was, but mine was to have it that there was there were certain waypoints in the world that you could teleport between safely. Any other place, and you and you are make and you are making a very dangerous gamble. Yeah, that's actually exactly how it works in D twenty Go. Except the the waypoints aren't necessarily pre established. Um, you personally can draw a teleportation circle um, and create a waypoint uh, if you know that spell. Mm -hmm. um, so you can you can set up you know your waypoints yeah. in advance. Um, and if you if you don't, then you're yeah you're you're taking a gamble, and you could end up you can end up anywhere within range. Um, you know how you've pro you probably you probably read a comic book at least once, so you're probably familiar with Nightcrawler. Oh yeah, and he has that whole he has the whole hab the whole habit of he needs to see where he's going when he's teleporting, otherwise mm -hmm. he fears he might teleport himself right into a wall. Yep. Uh, even if he can. Even if he can feasibly teleport through walls, it's one, it's one of those it's one of those things where the me the mental game ends up winning out. And yeah. I I just do, I just go a step further with it by having it that when someone's teleporting, what they're really doing is going into the astral plane and then coming out at a different point. The problem mm -hmm. is the astral plane is not ex is not exactly a calm area. It's it's like be it's like being in the, it's like being in the worst storm in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> so unless, I, uh, you, unless you know the, unless you can figure out how to manage the currents, you're going to get swept up. With uh, with D twenty go teleports part of the, the evocations um, yeah. spells, which is a uh, it's the uh, the branch of magic that is about uh, space spatial awareness. You know, does you know does space spatial distance actually matter? Mm -hmm. um, kind of the uh, I don't know if you've read it, the wrinkle in time approach to, to teleportation that I'm not, I'm not, you know, transforming myself into energy and beaming myself over there. I'm wrinkling the, you know, mm -hmm. time space continuum and just connecting two points. I haven't, I haven't gone through a wrink. I haven't gone through a wrinkle in time since I, since I was in high school. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, it's been 30 years since I've read that book. Yeah. Um, some some stuff sticks with you though, you know. Mm -hmm. Very true. Yeah. And now one th one thing that you added that I that I definitely don't recall in any version of D and D was the rules for mages duels. <laughs> yeah. So we uh we had a play test group that was it was all wizards. Mm -hmm. Um, we were uh, we were setting up like this mage school, and uh, the plan was to have a West Marches campaign with multiple DMs rotating, um, doing kind of like a, a Hogwarts thing, but in a D and D setting. Mm -hmm. um, we we didn't get enough players to show up to uh, to set the whole thing up, but we started thinking with the idea of, of dueling. You know, if we're gonna have a mage school, then there's got to be a duelings class, right? And one of the one of my players wanted to run the duel, be the teacher of the dueling class. And so we brainstormed and came up with these dueling rules. And the idea for the dueling rules is that it, the GM does not have to be present. So, you know, especially with play by post, you know, not everybody's going to be online at the same time. But if you can, if you're doing that kind of, you know, a, a mage game and two people are online at the same time, you can kill some time just by doing the dueling rules. Uh, and there's a lot of other places where a player versus player conflict, conflict to me is fascinating. You know, if you've got mature people that can use it effectively, you can have a group that is never exactly on the same page, but always working towards the same goal. And so you can play out a lot of that conflict, and the dueling rules give you an opportunity to do that uh, without without slowing down the game considerably. Mm -hmm. And now, when it came now, the other thing that I could other thing that I couldn't help but notice is that instead of, I guess, in an effort to reduce the amount to reduce the amount of number checking. Instead of doing hit points, you just have health. You just have healthy and injured. Yeah, you can be you can be injured. Injured just means you've got like general damage, you know, bruise, scratch, wherever. Nothing specific. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also get major injuries if you roll a one in combat. That's a major injury, and the GM will roll for location and severity. So you know, a limb might be hindered. Uh, it might be disabled, um, or you might have a mortal injury where you're bleeding out, yep. uh, and that'll require some immediate attention. And so that creates some some drama without having to worry about tracking hit points. And 
Well, to well to steal to steal a line from the steal line from the Dark Master team, make criticals hurt again. <laughs> I know, right? I have had we had one guy that was running his first game um, early in the playtest, and he he accidentally killed both goblins in the party, uh, and so he became known as the Goblin Slayer um, because both of them rolled ones on their major injuries, and then he rolled twenties on their severity, and so he just dropped them. And uh, I, maybe because he was a new GM, he struggled with the idea of finding a way to narratively save them, you know? Mm -hmm. I think a GM should always be able to bend the rules when it keeps the story going. Um, but one of the goblins just wanted a dramatic death anyway, so we just had fun with it. Yeah. So now we have Chamber of the Goblin Killer. Um, I never had anything like that, although I did have a case of, of suplexing a dragon, so I've got that under Ooh. my cap. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, it was a it was a black it was a black dragon who kept who kept hiding in his swamp, then popping out using breath weapons. So I just charged the thing, and then I forgot <laughs> that dragons can fly. So I tried to so I tried a pin. Oh jeez! It was a case of if I did if I didn't if I didn't if I didn't get, if I didn't get anything but a t if I got anything but a twenty, I would end up dead. Of and, course, you rolled twenty. Yeah. Yeah, don't ever. That's it's one of those things that like that's a, a GMing lesson right there. Don't ever. If a player comes up with a terrible idea, don't tell them that they can only su succeed on a twenty because they're going to roll the damn twenty. Um. Well, there's been. Well, there was one time where somebody ended up trying to do a dumb idea, saying, "Hey, I've got a five percent chance," and then they <laughs> up rolling a one. Oh. Ooh. And <laughs> I did not let him live it down for a week. Because I, because it's not like I, it's not like I always tell people to be very very careful with the dice gods because they are cruel bastards who want you to suffer. They're That's a model right. of equality. The dice gods hate everyone. Yeah, yeah. But when it came to doing something like a something like a major injuries table, um, where where what would you what did you use as your as your point of reference for that? Because D and D's never really, um, never really played all that all that much attention to to um, location based injuries. Um, I uh, I guess around the early two thousands, uh, I think it was GURPS that I was reading up on. I never got a chance to play any GURPS, but I think that's where I got the original idea from it from, from for it from. Um, but the what I wanted to do with D twenty go was keep it as, as simple as possible, so they don't actually have to reference a chart. You know, you shouldn't have to. That's the goal. You shouldn't have to. If you're wanting, wanting to play on mobile and it keep it keep it online, uh, play by post. You should have to reference the book as little as possible. Um, so I started with figuring up the probability of death, like statistically, how what, how high of a percentage do I want of death, and 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 different severities, and then I, I broke it down. You know, roll a D twenty. Um, is it? It's a one, two, three are the legs, um, uh, minor, minor, major. And then four, five, six is uh, the left arm. Seven, eight, nine is the right arm. Um, 10, 11 is the abdomen. 12, 13 is the torso. And then 15 through, I think 15 through 19 is weapon breakage. And then a 20 is death. Yeah. Although I do, I do want to point out the irony of, of wanting, to keep, wanting to keep things simple and you use GURPS for inspiration. Well, now, wait a minute. <laughs> that was a long time ago that I was looking at GURPS. A long, long time ago. Yeah, GURPS is a. Uh, it's pretty crunchy. It's pretty quick um, when you get to know it, but you have to you have to really know it to make it quick. And there's just GURPS is the sole reason I still have my TI eighty three. They have a rule for everything in that game, don't they? Yeah, it. it I games like GURPS and Hero. Um, I treat them more as programming languages than games for for starters. Oh, yeah. But also, um, I will free I will freely bring those games up anytime somebody complains that uh, a give a given game is too complicated. Mm -hmm. Like if mm -hmm. they tell me that D and D or Pathfinder is too complicated, I will I will break out my my uh, copy of Hero System Fifth Edition and beat them with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember that book. Oh God, oh that's a big book. Yeah, and then sixth edition came came around. It was even bigger. I don't know though. I mean, the, the player's handbook now, fifth edition, is weighing in at like three hundred thousand words or something like that. I, I, that's just, no, and that's just I'm, the player's handbook, you know, three hundred thousand words. 
E20Go is 16,000 words. It yeah. can do everything that, that fifth edition can do, like literally everything. I should know. know when I mentioned yeah. sixth edition, I was refer I was referring to sixth edition Hero System. Yeah, that yeah. that was the the black book with the uh, the Da Vinci Man in green on the front, wasn't it? No. no. Um, okay, never. Mind. They've had the Da Vinci Man for that was um. It was black and green in fi in fifth edition. It w they they went blue and and yellow for sixth edition. Okay, I'm thinking of the fifth one then. Mm-hmm. Although the fifth one isn't that isn't much of a isn't that much of a slouch either. Yeah, yeah, for real. But I mean, there's there's a there's there's some narrative beauty in in having an actual injury system. You know, mm -hmm. hit points just drive me crazy. You know, well I'm at I've got 50 hit points total and I've been stabbed 18 times and now I'm at 20 hit points. Well, where have I been stabbed? Well, I don't know. You're at 20 hit points. Like I, like, where's where's the the story in that? You know, it's just a and it's just a numbers game and it's not really a a, a role playing game anymore. Which, um, on one hand, I on one hand I can definitely see that, and on the other hand, I realize I, I realize I'm sounding like a broken record saying this kind of thing, but it's one of those relics of D and D's origins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because obvi obviously, go obviously, going with a hit point or going with a hit point based system makes sense for a war game when you've got a shit ton of of characters on the field. Yeah. You can't you can't really do a wound system in the same way that you could do for an RPG. Just okay, you could, but you'd have. To, but imagine having to do that for a hundred units. Yeah, yeah. Like unless you've got unless you've got a computer to handle some of the work, it's not <laughs> worth it. No, absolutely not. Now, when it com when it comes to. When it comes to the when it comes to the um, whole the whole idea of rolling rolling multiple d twenties for mm -hmm. for heroics and for uh, combat, I will admit that that I found interesting because in a weird way it reminded me of the Dark Eye, which kind of has oh, a similar know that, right? roll three d twenty approach. At least it does in mm -hmm. its most current edition. I don't know if its earlier editions did because well, I don't speak German. <laughs> but what was was that was that something that was developed early on, or was that something that kind of developed through playtesting? Yeah, that came out about pretty early on. Um, with with the heroics role taking up an entire scene, I didn't want it to just be a single die because, well, if you're like me, if if a, a fight depends on a single die, you're going to roll low. You know, I'm just you know, the law of averages does not work for me. I'm always going to roll low when, when especially when it matters. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, the the ebb and flow of combat shouldn't just be a single die. You know, a single die is a single action. So, the uh, the three d twenty it it did start off where um, the number of dice you rolled depended on how many characters you had in your party. Um, so you'd have to reference a chart. You know, if you only had one person playing, it was a four d twenty. If you had two people playing, I think each person rolled three. If you had um, four or more, each person rolled two. Uh, there was a, a variable number of dice they rolled, um, and that that system was terrible. It was too much, too many charts to check. Um, but I still wanted to have a handful of dice, you know, a few dice that represent all of the combat. You know, I kind of like to think of this isn't actually how it works because it's more abstract than this. Kind of like think of you know maybe one die represents your offense in that battle, and one die represents your defense in that battle, and the other die represents your maneuverability in that battle, mm -hmm. um, rather than it all just being a single roll. Which de um, definitely makes se definitely makes sense. When it come now, when it ca when it came to when it came to advan when it came to advancement, one of the things that I saw that is that you're doing the um, you're doing a twenty level setup, which mm. is something I find interesting because a lot of simplified takes with um. With D twenty, a lot of simplified hacks just go with um, five levels, or they'll go with the leveling setup you'd see in AD and D. Yeah. Was um, going well, with was going with twenty levels just a case of keeping things standard? Yeah, yeah, I think standardizing it uh, it helps with conversions. Um, you know, if you were going from fifth edition to play in D twenty go, you can keep the spell system from fifth edition. You don't have to learn new spells. 
Um, if you're, you know, transferring stuff, if you uh, were playing a, a D and D campaign and you, you know, you've been playing with your, your same group of friends for several years, you were like level 15 or something, and you wanted to keep that campaign going, but somebody moved away. Uh, you can switch to D20 go in like 10 minutes <laughs> and nothing else has to change. Um, and, and staying with the 20 level system helps, helps keep that going. You know, all the published material for D and D, uh, or Pathfinder or whatever, um, as long as it's on the 20 level system, it just converts right over super, super easy, super fast. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that makes it a little bit more recognizable to players. Which definitely makes, definitely makes sense. Now, when it comes to traits, which I'd argue is get, I'd argue is going to be the big, the deepest part of the pond when it comes to customization. Oh my um, god! Yeah, it's crazy. What? First, now, uh, first off, what would you what would you say is the defining line between if if someone were to expand on D twenties, D twenty goes ideas? What would be the defining line between what would count as a class feature? And what would count as a trait? Um, class features are quite a bit more powerful than individual traits. And there's a couple of direct comparisons uh, that you could look at to, to see that. Um, just the, the armor class, or the armor options of the, the Vanguard compared to the Hardy trait. Hardy is just a straight plus three to your injury check. Whereas a Vanguard's armor, you know, if he's wearing full plate, he's getting a plus five to his injury check. Mm -hmm. um, Class features are, are just slightly, slightly more powered, uh, and they're set. You know, class features aren't meant to be tinkered with a whole lot. I mean, I guess there's there's nothing wrong with somebody creating their own class. It'd probably be pretty easy to do, um, but the customization is supposed to happen in the traits. Yeah, and when when it comes to when it comes to it, I'm get I'm guessing that you that aside from types, there isn't there isn't really a whole lot of prerequisite finagling with traits. No, no, not really. Um, there's a few of them. You know, you can't be a master craftsman until you have also been an amateur and a journeyman craftsman. Um, there's a, a greater telekinesis, and you can't have greater until you've got lesser, which allows me to create traits that are powerful and still keep them balanced by having prerequisites to build up to them. Um, but, you know, it, it, I didn't want to bother a whole lot with prerequisites, just, just so you can have more freedom to create your character. Mm-hmm. Now, when it came, now obvious since you talked since you talked about it a bit earlier, I want I want to dip into a bit of Star Twenty Go. Okay. Um, what were some going from a fantasy to an SF game? What were some of the things that you felt you had to unlearn from its from your previous work? Armor, really. Um, and it, after I after I got myself to accept that armor wasn't a thing didn't need to be a thing uh, i realized that it just made everything easier you know um the, the equipment side of DD is one of the hardest and crunchiest things to deal with you know i've got to count up all my modifiers before i make my roll for all my 30 magic items or whatever mm -hmm. um armor is built into the trooper class as like a class feature kind of like if you were you know a mandalorian or a stormtrooper mm -hmm. um and, and that's it, you know, it's done. It's a class feature, follow the feature, you know, and you just assume that character is armored when he goes into battle uh, and um, no one's done with it. Um, but it was it was a pretty smooth transition, you know? I just try to capture the spirit of, my daughter is a, just crazy obsessed with Star Wars right now. So we've been watching, I've watched all the Star Wars movies at least once over the past six months, three months. And uh, it's to capture the spirit of Star Wars and the spirit of Firefly. I figured if you could play either of those stories using star 20 go then i think it's successful which i could i can definitely i can definitely see mm -hmm. um and i'm get i'm guessing that when you sat down to actually write star 20 go one of the first things that you wanted to nail down was hat was having a um ship creation system yeah yeah and i uh i got stars without number and went through that and um oh wow <laughs> you know i don't know if you've played star Trek number but it's i, ha it's I have and i've i've co i've covered it and i'm looking forward to worlds without number as well yeah yeah um it, it's that that's that's some serious some serious depth you know um so the idea was to to 
to set up something like that, but easy, you know, something you could jump right into quickly. I even, I've been, I keep tinkering with Excel just to make stuff mess around. And uh, I made a, an automatic ship generator in Excel. So you just click a button and it builds you a ship. <laughs> it even gives you a random ship name and everything. Um, and it's just, it's been a lot of fun to play with, you know. I mean, I'm in actually in a Star 20 Go game right now, and we, uh, yeah, we have our own ship, but it's kind of a disaster. So the the boss gave us his ship to use. His ship's called the Horsefly, and we have to go and we are we're doing a you know the basic ship heist, but it's like a cargo ship. We've uh, we've mag locked onto this cargo ship, and uh, we're in the battle, you know, trying to get to the bridge to take over the ship right now. Uh, and all the ships, you know, just thrown together with some traits real quick. Pretty easy to do. Mm-hmm. Now, when it came when it when it came to the idea of of bringing in some of the more magical end of ends of things, since obviously so obviously so there's going to be that one person who wants to talk and talk his way into playing as a Jedi, mm-hmm. yep. and then get and then getting disappointed when you're when you say no. Um, <laughs> wait, wait, why are you? Who's saying no? Because I'm not saying no to a Jedi. Go for it. Play whatever you want to play. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that, that's partially me making making a bit of a t- making a bit of a tongue in cheek joke regard in reference to Star Wars Galaxies. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Oh yeah. You're right. I forgot about that. Because um, because uh, because Edwards did not want to put Jedi in put Jedi as playable, and mm-hmm. his and. In my opinion, he actually had a he actually had a good reason why. Yeah, absolutely. It, it was because Jedi would be an alpha class, and would and would kind of once that's in, it's a case of everybody wants to be a Jedi, but not ev- but not everybody can. And a game like a sandbox game like that needs variety in characters. Yeah. So the only re- the only reason he made it so complex was because Sony forced his hand into into putting it in. Yeah. Um, and I do see that 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 you ca- that you kind of have it with the mystic. Mm-hmm. Although, was it when it came when it came to do, when it came to doing the when it came to doing the mystic was was it a case where you wanted it to kind of kind of be in the same ballpark as the as the spell casting classes from core d20 go but all but also be it a bit different um or was it a case where you wanted it to be its own spin um I re- really it was just to to bring the spell casting in into the uh, the system um but still keep it, keep it kind of quick and simple um, if I were building a Jedi in Star 20 Go, I would not go straight Mystic because the straight Mystic is just a straight spellcaster. Uh, I would probably take like the uh, the martial artist. You know, in, in Star 20 Go, you multi-class by you pick which two classes you want and you choose. Um, oh, I think it's three class features from among the two classes. Hmm. So I would take like the martial artist class, but I would pick up the Mystic attack from the Mystic. And now I've got my Jedi character that's more of a he's combat oriented. He's a martial artist in essence. He also has this sort of mystical attack, which is represented by the lightsaber. Um, Although, speaking of Jedi, I'm curious how you'd repre- how you'd represent some of the um, co- some of the lightsaber combat forms. Oh, uh, so that's that's actually easier if you if you're asking what I think you're asking. It's easier than than what you'd think because you don't do turn based combat in D20 Go. You know, you get to it's it's narrative. So I'll roll my my three D twenty. For my my attack and everything, and the GM will tell us what the outcome. Oh yeah, you were successful, you know. So now describe your battle, and then I get to describe what I did in that combat. Mm-hmm. I get to describe the scene from my perspective uh, after making the roll and everything. Which I could I could certainly I could certainly see. Um, on the other hand, give, given the given the trinity of slaughter, melee, and skirmish, I could see the um, combat forms represented in a way there. I'm more specifically mm-hmm. referring to the seven, to the seven um, lightsaber fighting styles. I do not know them. Um, well, j- just to give just to give a few examples, um, Count Dooku is mm-hmm. a form two adept. Form two is Makashi. 
which is which is very much the fencer's form. Okay. Um, Yoda is a form for adept, um, which has a lot more in common with Wushu. Um, I'm sorry, with what? With Wushu. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so lot. what I would do is um, build your multi-class based on that. You know, if you uh, if you're going with the form two, that's more the the duelist or the fencer. I would probably do swashbuckler mystic mm -hmm. instead of martial artist mystic. Uh, and then you've got the swashbucklers um, combat ability and the swashbucklers uh, show off ability mixed with the, the Jedi mystic attack. Mm -hmm. um, but if I want to do, you know, Yoda's style, uh, I would definitely stick with the, the martial artist and pick up the martial artist Chingong, uh, that ability to, to use your athletics role um, with a combat attack. Yeah. Um, Ob um, another example is Obi-Wan, who during the Clone Wars, he was a um, Form 3 expert, which is all, which is all about pure defense. Oh yeah, then you would definitely well. Let's probably go champion with that. Yeah, champion mystic. Mm -hmm. um, form f form five is known as either Xian or or Gem So, and it has a lot more in common with kendo or broadsword fighting because it's more because there is it is kind of built on some on on defense. But instead mm -hmm. of constant blocking, it's more about matching strength with strength. Oh yeah. I'm get. Yeah, uh, and, and the the whole idea with the just not just with the classes, but also with the traits is is to create options for for customizability. You know, you can customize the character uh, any way you want without having to to pick a certain path to go down. That you know, with the 3.5 headed that way with the prestige classes, and I think 5th edition has really bought into this idea of, of a, each character having its own path that you follow. Um, and D20 Go is just, it's just more open-ended. Yeah, per pretty much. Um, and I that's why I do... Uh, one thing that I that I noticed in the tail end of the, of the book that I definitely appreciate is, um, the, te is the templates... Mm -hmm. While a lot of games have their sample characters, I find that I find that one sample character often is a little too vanilla, the way it's written out. Yeah. And I do realize the irony in saying that when a big pillar of my review style is making a sample character, <laughs> but like a lot of t a lot of times they'll make a very basic character and they don't really show the potential that can be had with um, a range with yeah. builds and that was that was definitely my goal with the char character template section was to show the the range of what can be done because there were some some weird characters in there and just out of curiosity what were some were the templates ones that you had created or were some of them created through your play testers um Oh, the, the the luchador was from that that player I told you about. Mm -hmm. uh, the quick draw gunslinger was also one of my players. Um, God, that guy he was he played this goblin noble, Lord Kotok, uh, and he, he was it was just nasty. He he held on to that show off ability from the swashbuckler um, as long as he could and would break it out in the, just the most perfect moments. Um, just you know, dropping people in duels and stuff like that. Just it was a very smart player. Um, all the rest of those it were just things that I was making up to show off different aspects of the game, though. Yeah, I could, I could, I could see that. And there's a there's a part of me that that would pro that would probably get a kick out of of tr of trying to make a Musashi analog mostly because I've been sh mostly because I've been sharing s some really dumb memes regarding Mus regarding Musashi's um <laughs> predilection for for showing up ridiculously late to duels. Yeah, yeah. That and not even bringing a sword to not even bringing a sword to a sword fight, just bringing in just bringing an ore or bringing a wooden sword that that he just carved a minute ago. Yeah, that's like such a it's just an iconic and you know legendary character. Yeah, yeah. 
one who was one whose famous book is one is one giant fuck you to to um samurai culture of his day. Yeah. But he, he was a good friend. Well, people who tend people who tend to sh- people who tend to shake things up or or be brutally honest about the way things are tend tend to piss a lot of people off. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now, when it com- now when it comes to when it comes to what when it comes to the future of D twenty go, what do you have? What do you have planned for down the pipe? I am. Uh, well, you ha- I finished a Z twenty go, which is the post apocalyptic or modern hack of it, um, and I'm in a playtest game of it right now. Mm-hmm. And uh, I should have that up on Drive RPG probably in the next month, maybe. Um, I'm, I'm actually working on a Pokemon hack just because I, I think there's a, the dueling rules, I think, create a unique opportunity. Um, I've just got to find some playtesters for that that are willing to just duel the hell out of each other for <laughs> several weeks um, just to see if that's balanced. But that, you know, that, that'll never be hosted on Drive RPG because I'll never get licensing for that. Um, and I want to do a, this spring, I want to do a, a, just a live stream of some actual play of D20 Go, which I, I think will be a little odd because it's not specifically designed for real time, but I have I have played it around a table before and it works fine. Um, but I think that just with the, the way players are today, uh, live you know live play, actual play streams um, are one of the best ways to get the word out mm-hmm. and to show people how to play the game. So I try to arrange that and find some players for that this spring. Well, I'll, I will def I will definitely be looking forward to seeing how that de- how that develops. Um. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the particular insanity that happens around here. It's been good. I appreciate it. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As All I right. Often, Sounds good, man. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I like it. And of course, Ace and Theor- Sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!